As a church body, the Word of God is what defines us. It's what gives us hope. With that purpose, we want to demonstrate obedience to God's calling as His church. Through much prayer, Bel Air has developed eight core values to help us follow what God has placed before us and what direction He wants us to go. As we walk through this series, we will see how our core values give us clear direction for our future. Bibles, please open them with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. If you're using a pew Bible, that is on page 996, and as you're turning there, uh, I just want to say that my family and I are so, so excited to be here at Bel Air uh, and to be here in Murfreesboro. Uh, we have sensed God's guiding hand throughout this whole process in our lives, probably more than we've ever sensed His guidance before. And so what we have come to is that we are convinced that we are right now in this place, in this moment, among this people, we are in the center of God's will. Uh, That's where we want to be. And so we're excited about what God has in store, and we're excited about discovering all that he has in store together with you. I want to say thank you to all of you who have uh, just loved on us and welcomed us and fed us and uh, just been so helpful in receiving us and welcoming us uh, to this church. Uh, we're so, so excited to be here. Uh, I'm, we're going to be starting this morning, as the video just showed, a new series on the eight core values of Bel Air. Uh, a core value is one of those central core beliefs and things that you think is more important than anything in the world. Let me just give you a little context here. You know actually more about this than I do, because over the last 19 months or so, in between pastors, God led this church to distill these core values, these eight values, and to list them out. And these are going to be then the guiding principles that guide us in this next stage of our journey as a church family together. So today, we begin by looking at those eight core values, the first of which is applied truth. And here's what I want to do before we even jump into the message this morning. If you're visiting with us today, if you're a guest with us today, maybe this is your first time here, maybe this is your first time here in a while, I want to challenge you and encourage you and and really just ask you to do something. I want to ask you to give us, after today, seven more weeks. That's a big commitment, I know, but I I just want to ask you, give us seven more weeks, and I believe that as we go throughout this series of the eight core values of this church, you will get a much bigger and better understanding of what Bel Air Baptist Church is all about. You'll see a good picture of what this church cares about, all right? So just encourage you to do that. Let's look together at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, and the title of my sermon this morning is Applied Truth. The Word of God says, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete equipped for every good work. Let's pray together. Father, we ask your blessing right now upon your word. Father, you said that the man who meditates on your word day and night is like a tree planted by streams of water, yielding its fruit in season. Its leaf never withers, and in all that he does, he prospers. God, we want that to be us. We want that to be our church. We pray that you would help that to be true as we look at your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to ask you this morning, how many of you have a favorite Bible? Raise your hand. You have a favorite Bible? Uh, I have about three favorite Bibles, uh, but one of my favorite Bibles is the one I'm holding in my hand right now. Uh, This is not the Bible that I usually preach from because it's so big, Uh, but it's one of my favorite Bibles because several years ago on my birthday, my parents gave me this Bible. And one of the reasons it's so meaningful to me is because in the opening section of this Bible, one of the front leaves of the Bible, front pages, they had inscribed this writing by an anonymous author about the Word of God. I want you to hear what it says. It's been so meaningful to me over the years. It says, preach the Bible. This book contains the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, and the happiness of believers. Its doctrines are holy, its precepts are binding, its histories are true, and its decisions are immutable. Read it to be wise, believe it to be safe, and practice it to be holy. It contains light to direct you, 
food to support you and comfort to cheer you. It is the traveler's map, the pilgrim's staff, the pilot's compass, the soldier's sword, and the Christian's character. Here paradise is restored, heaven opened, and the gates of hell disclosed. Christ is its grand object, our good is its design, and the glory of God is its end. It should fill the memory, rule the heart, and guide the feet. Read it slowly, frequently, and prayerfully. It is given you in life, will be opened in the judgment, and will be remembered forever. It involves the highest responsibility, will reward the greatest labor, and will condemn all who trifle with its sacred contents. The Bible is the word of God. A person who ignores the Bible will ultimately perish. And a church that ignores the Bible will ultimately wither and not be blessed by God. And I cannot think of a better way to start my preaching ministry as your pastor in this pulpit than to preach a sermon this morning with you about the importance of the Word of God. That's what 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 through 17 are all about. If I were to summarize to you what these two verses are teaching us, it would be this, that the Bible is God's truth, and the Bible is practical and applies to your life. Applied truth. The Bible is God's truth, and the Bible is practical and applies to your life. I want you to notice with me this morning three truths about the Bible that we see in our text. Number one, we see in verse 16 that the Word of God teaches us that Scripture or the Bible is true. If you're taking notes, it's a note sheet there in your bulletin. Scripture, we learn, is true. Notice what Paul here, the author of 2 Timothy, says about the truth of Scripture in verse 16. He says in verse 16, all Scripture, that's the Bible, is breathed out by God. Notice that. All Scripture is breathed out by God. Some translations translate that. All Scripture is inspired by God. To inspire means to breathe out or to breathe into. Why is that language used? Well, because it's with your breath that you speak and form words. So what Paul is telling us here is that when we hold the Bible in our hands and read its words and teach its concepts, we have not only in the Word of God the Word of men, we have also the Word of God Himself. God has breathed out and spoken the words of Scripture. The Bible is the Word of God. Or Peter says it this way in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. Notice on the screens what he says there. Peter says, for no prophecy, the Bible is full of prophecy, was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Men spoke from God. This is the doctrine of inspiration, that the Bible is the word of God. But notice here, Paul in 2 Timothy 3 goes beyond what Peter says there and says that not only were the men who prophesied God's word, not only were they inspired, Not only was what they said inspired, but down to the very letters and words that they wrote and inscribed with pens, those very words were inspired and breathed out by God. That's what he means in verse 16 when he says all Scripture is breathed out by God. Scripture is the written or inscribed word of God. Now, if you think about it, what Paul is telling us is is a couple things. First of all, Paul is telling us something about the authorship of Scripture. On the one hand, Paul is teaching us that Yes, Scripture is written by men. One of the authors of Scripture, one of the kinds of authors of Scripture is men. The Bible has about 35 to 40 different human authors that wrote it. Think about men like Moses who wrote Genesis in the first five books of the Bible. Think about men like Paul who wrote the book that we're looking at this morning that we call 2 Timothy. Men wrote the Bible, but that's not all. Because what the Scriptures are also teaching is that when men wrote the words of Scripture, God was moving them so that they wrote exactly what he wanted written. Every word, every phrase, every sentence, every chapter, every book, everything was exactly as if God had spoken it himself. The scriptures were breathed out by God. In the pages of scriptures, we hear the voice of God. My kids have a children's book, lots of children's books. My kids have a children's book, though, that's very special to them because it was given to them by Melissa's mom. My wife, Melissa, and I have been married for 14 years, and her mom 
gave my kids this really neat book. And the thing about this book was that this book has a built-in recorder in it. And so before she ever gave this book to our children, she actually recorded her voice reading the words of the book. Have you ever seen one of those before? And so now when my children open the book, they not only can read the words, they can push play and hear Mimi reading the words. And they can follow, and and Mimi's voice, my mother-in-law's voice, comes out of the pages of that book and speaks the words to them. Here's what Paul is saying. When we open up the word of God and we read it, it's as if God's voice is coming out of the pages. God's voice has been recorded for us in this book. That is, there is nothing more miraculous than that. There's nothing more wonderful than that. There's nothing more important than that. Scripture is the word of God. I want to point out to you, though, something else. Notice here that Paul says, not only that Scripture is breathed out by God, but notice that little word that begins verse 16. What is the word? Do you see it? All. Notice that Paul says here that all Scripture is breathed out by God. Here's what he's saying. Paul is saying that every word of Scripture, every sentence, every chapter, every book in the Bible, all of it from beginning to end, from Genesis to Revelation and everywhere in between, all of it is breathed out by God and is the Word of God. Here's what that means. That means the parts that you like are breathed out by God, and the parts that you don't like are breathed out by God. It means the parts that comfort you are breathed out by God, and it means the parts that make you uncomfortable are breathed out by God. It means the parts that encourage you are breathed out by God, and it means the parts that convict you are breathed out by God. Listen, at at one level, here's what this means. Paul is telling us that we live in a world where the creator of the universe has spoken to us and has revealed to us his truth and his standards. It didn't have to be that way. Did you know that, that God could have created the world, taken a step back, and some people actually believe this, he could have created the world, taken a step back, distanced himself from us, and then just left us to figure it out on our own. But instead, here's what God did. He created the world, and then he spoke to the world. He spoke to the people that he created. He gave the people he created his word so that in his word, we would have his truth, his standards, and we would not be left to figure things out on our own. Uh, You know, being in a world where you don't have standards, where you don't have the word of God, it's kind of like you have free reign to do whatever you want, right? I mean, if God doesn't exist, if there is no higher power, and if God has not revealed to humanity his standard and way of living life, the difference between right and wrong, then ultimately, then we could do whatever we want, right? And some people believe that. It's kind of like there are some places in the United States, did you know this, where there are no speed limits. There are a few places. One is in the Central Valley section of California. You can go to roads right now in Central Valley, California, and there are absolutely no speed limits. Some of you I see from perking your ears up here. Here's what that means. It means you are free to set your own speed limit. Wouldn't that be neat? Now, some of y'all would still go 45 miles an hour, I can tell you right now. I passed by some of y'all on the way to church this morning. But no speed limits. No, you get to set your own limits. You get to set your own standards. And some people are living life that way. I wonder if there's anybody in the room this morning who's living your life as if there's not a standard. See, in the rest of the world, there are speed limits. In the rest of the, the roads that we're on, the majority of them, the law has spoken. And the standard is clear. We can, we can ignore it, but it's there. But I wonder how many of us in the room this morning are living as if we are in a place where there is no speed limit. And we're doing marriage and sexuality your way instead of God's way. And you're doing parenting your way instead of God's way. And you're doing work your way, setting your own standards. You're doing money and finances your way, setting your own standards. You're trying to do church your way, setting your own standards. And all of that is fine if there's no God and if he hasn't spoken. I'm here to tell you this morning there is a God, and he has spoken. And we have his words for us inscribed and breathed out by him in the pages of this book, we are not left wondering. He sets the standard for our lives. He sets the standard for our church. If this church or any church is going to be built and going to uh, 
be fruitful for him and glorify him. It's only going to happen if it's built on the foundation of the word of God, the scripture. So scripture is true. But the second thing that Paul tells us this morning about the Bible is that not only is scripture true, but secondly, we see here that scripture is practical. And this is really important. That's why we've we've entitled this Applied Truth. Applied Truth. You see, in the Bible, we not only have the truth of God, we also have truths that are practical and useful for our lives. Notice what he says again in verse 16. All Scripture is breathed out by God, and notice, and is what? Profitable. Profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Just just focus on that little word, profitable. All Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable. That word profitable means that Scripture is useful. Scripture is helpful. Scripture is practical. Don't you like things that are practical? Uh, I, I was 14 years old when I first surrendered to the call to ministry. I went before our church in Gardendale, Alabama, and I told them that I, I felt called to ministry. Until that time, I still wanted to be a preacher, just, but it was just because my dad was. And, you know, sometimes when you're growing up, you just want to be what your dad was. But eventually that became a calling. And when I was 14, I went before the church and said, I want to be a pastor. Now, I strayed from that for a little while, but when I was 18 years old, I preached my first sermon in the summer right before going off to college, and then I moved off to Union University in Jackson, Tennessee, where I started uh, studying biblical studies and training to be a pastor. But did you know that when I got to college, they forced me to not only study the Bible, but also to take a lot of other court classes? And that really made me mad. I was going to be a pastor, but I still had to take algebra. And I remember sitting in algebra class, right, and I'm learning algebraic equations, and I'm doing things like figuring out the value of X. Now, that blew my mind. I thought math was about numbers, and then they put, started putting letters in there, and it just, I couldn't do that. And I started thinking to myself, how is knowing this algebra going to help me be a good pastor? When am I ever going to use this? I started envisioning situations where I could use this in pastoral ministry. (laughs) You know, a couple comes in with tears in their eyes. They sit down in my office as a pastor of a church. They say, Pastor, our marriage is falling apart. Can you help us? So I pull out a sheet of paper and start doing an algebraic equation. (laughs) See, what you have here is X, and here's what that means. And Yeah. And here's the deal. Algebra is not going to help me in that situation. So I started thinking, how is this useful? How is this practical? It just wasn't practical for me. And here's the deal. Some of us feel the same way about the Bible. You th- you're thinking to yourself, how is this book that is thousands of years old, how is this book, so much of which tells me about the history of a people in the Middle East thousands of years ago, how is this useful to me? How is this practical to me? How am I ever going to use this in my marriage? How am I ever going to use this in raising my kids? How am I ever going to use this in my daily life? And what I want you to know this morning and what Paul is telling us is that Scripture is not only true, it is profitable. It is useful. It is helpful. It applies to every part of your life. It is very, very practical. Here's what Paul says about it elsewhere in Romans chapter 15, verse 4. Paul says, for whatever was written in former days, that's primarily the Old Testament, what God has written in his word about Israel. Whatever was written in former days, notice, was written for our instruction. You see that? Listen, when Moses, thousands of years ago, was writing the book of Genesis, God was writing it for you. When Joshua was writing Joshua, when Isaiah was giving his prophecies, when Daniel in Babylonian captivity was writing down the visions that God had given to him, when David was inscribing Psalm 23 about how he walked through the valley of the shadow of death, God was doing it for those people back then, but God was just as much inspiring it for you in the 21st century right now, where you are, where you live, the situations you face, with what you're going through in your life. Paul says, those things were written in former days, were written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. 
Now, how exactly is the Bible practical? You say, okay, Paul, you say that, that Scripture is profitable. How? Well, great question. He goes on to answer it. Notice what he says in verse 16 again. He says, all Scripture is profitable. Notice, four, and then he gives us four ways that Scripture is profitable. For teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Now, if you look at that, look at that sentence, look at that verse in your Bible. What you'll see out of those four truths is this. Paul, the, the first one listed, teaching, and the last one listed, training and righteousness, go together. Those, those are the positive things. Teaching and training and righteousness are the positive ways that Scripture is useful. And then the two concepts in the middle, reproof and correction, go together. Let's look at both of those phrases, both of those groups in turn then. Notice, first of all, Paul tells us the Scripture is profitable for teaching and training and righteousness. They go together. Teaching. Scripture is useful. Scripture is practical. In teaching, the Word of God teaches us. How many of you know that you don't know all that you need to know? Raise your hand. If you didn't get that, I'll say it again. How many of you know that you don't know everything you need to know? Raise your hand again. And if you don't have your hand up, that just proves the point that you don't know everything you need to know. <laughs> and what Paul is saying is, one of the reasons God has given us His Word and spoken to us in Scripture it's because we need to know some things. We need to know some things that we don't currently know. You don't come into this world knowing anything. We just had a baby three months ago. Drake doesn't know anything. He knows stuff now that he didn't know three months ago. Like, I can cry and they'll feed me. You know, he, he, he's figuring things out. But you don't just come into the world with all this knowledge downloaded, like a computer into your brain. Instead, you have to learn, even Jesus had to learn when he was growing up. Jesus, the Bible says, when he was a child, grew in wisdom. How many of you know that if Jesus had to grow in wisdom, you and I might have to grow in wisdom? And so Paul says that the Bible is useful, and one of the ways that it's practical is that it teaches us things that we need to know. But then it goes a little further than that. The Bible doesn't, isn't just there to teach us things. He also says that it's there for training in righteousness. Now, those two things are related. Training in righteousness, training involves teaching, but it goes a little bit further than just teaching. Training. This word for training, for training in righteousness there, every other time this word training is used in the New Testament, it's used for a father training or disciplining his child. All right? And so it's kind of like this. It's kind of like you can teach your child how to ride a bike. You can tell them, all right, here's how you ride a bike, child. You push off with your feet, you get going a little bit, and then you start pedaling with your feet and you keep your balance. But how many times is, is that enough? Never. And so what do you have to do? You got to go out there with the child. I've done this on several occasions. You got to go out into the street, out into the cove, out into the driveway, and you've got to walk beside that child. At first, you're helping them keep their balance, and you're walking, and then when they fall down off the bike, you, you pick them back up and you walk beside them. Listen, that's the word here that Paul is using for training. And what, what Paul is telling us is this, that in the Scriptures, God has not only spoken to us to tell us things that are true, teaching, He has also, I love this, in the Scriptures, God has also come alongside us, and He is walking beside us like a father with his child. And he's not just telling us what to do, he's training us in what to do. And when we fall down through the scriptures, he's picking us back up and setting us back on the seat and getting us going in the right direction so we can do it all again, all right? That's what he's saying. The scriptures are useful. The scriptures are practical. They teach you things you need to know. They train you in ways that you need to go, in ways of righteousness. Those are the positive things the Scripture does. But notice, we also need the negative effects of Scripture in our lives. We don't just need to, to be told what we need to do. We need to be told what we don't need to do. Amen? We don't need to be shown just how to do something. We need to be shown how not to do something, some things. And so notice, the second group of, of concepts that he uses in the middle here is reproof and correction. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching for reproof and for correction. Here's the thing. Reproof, what is that? Reproof is like when somebody says, stop. Stop doing that. 
And sometimes, if you know that in God's word, he will tell you, stop. Stop doing that. He will tell you, no, don't do that. I remember we had uh, some kids. This is uh, the first church that I ever pastored. We had some, some children whose parents had to work on Sundays. And so for a while there, they spent the night with us on Saturday night, and we would take them with us to church on Sunday morning. And so they were uh, four boys, and they were all boy. And, uh, and so we, we would eat dinner together, and then we would put them to bed, and, uh, and then we'd wake up and they'd go to church. Well, these boys had never been told no. And here's how I knew it. The first time they did something that Melissa and I did not approve of, we said, stop it. Don't do that. No, you can't do it. And they looked at me like a deer in the headlights. Like, what did he say? No. Here's the thing. In God's word, sometimes the word of God will reprove you. It will tell you, he will tell you no. He will tell you, stop it. That's what reproof is. But then, there's a second one, and that is correction. And just like training takes teaching to a whole nother level, correction takes reproof to a whole nother level. In reproof, God says, stop. In correction, God says, go this way instead. And God corrects us as God gets us growing and going in the right direction. That's what Scripture does. Listen, the Bible is extremely practical. We need this book. As individuals, we need this book as a church. So the scripture is true. Scripture is practical. And then the third truth that we see here in our text about the Bible this morning is that scripture is powerful. Scripture is powerful. I mean, it it comes from God after all. And God is the creator and sovereign sustainer of the universe. God is the most powerful force in the universe. So it makes sense that what he says is powerful as well. Notice again how we see that in verse 17. So he says in verse 16, all scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Verse 17 says, so that the man of God or woman of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Equipped for every good work. Every good work. Let's start there. You and I were saved so that we could do good works. We were saved because God has some great things that he wants us to do. Look to your neighbor and say, I've got some good things to do. Say it. All right, now look to him and say, we've got some good things to do. God saved you. God saved me. God saved us and put us here as a church because he has given us some good works to do. Paul says this in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 10. Notice what he says. We love this passage about salvation, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, but verse 10 tells us why he saved us. Notice, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Verse 10, for we are his workmanship, notice, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That's what Paul is saying in our passage in verse 17 when he says that that we may be equipped for every good work. Now, what kind of good work does Paul have in mind? I think he's got the whole spectrum of Christian good works in mind. I mean, all kinds of things could fit into that category of good works, but I think the chief among them for Paul, as you look at his life, what good work was he devoted to the most? What good work was he giving his life for the most? I think his good work was the Great Commission. Paul was giving his life to complete the Great Commission that Jesus gave in Matthew 28, his final words to his disciples, where he said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. So when Paul says we were saved, we were created for good works, and the Word of God equipped us for good works, I think chief in his mind, he's got this idea of the Great Commission, that we are to impact a lost world with the gospel of Jesus Christ, And we are to see people of all different ethnicities. That's what it means by all nations. We're to see all kinds of people from all different kinds of backgrounds, both in our own Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth, become disciples of Jesus Christ. But here's the thing. Have you ever just sat there and thought to yourself how massive that task is? There are seven plus billion people in the world. Many millions of whom, billions of whom, have never even heard the gospel. There are thousands of people all over the community who have 
who do not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Have you ever thought about the magnitude of that work and of that mission and just thought, man, that's beyond me. I'm not equipped for that. I don't have what it takes to fulfill that. Well, notice what Paul says about that. So God has, God has given us these good works, but notice what he says. This is the power of Scripture. What he says in verse 17 is this, that the man or woman of God may be complete. Complete. Complete means competent. Complete means that you're qualified to do something. And then he goes on to say, complete, equipped for every good work. Equipped has a similar meaning. Equipped means that you have what it takes to do something, that you have Everything you need, if you're equipped, you have everything you need to be able to do this and to do it effectively. Scripture is that way. Scripture is so powerful that it takes people like me and you, it takes little old me, and with Scripture, with the power of the Word of God, I go from being someone who's not qualified and vastly underqualified to being someone who is qualified. I go from being someone who doesn't have what it takes to, with Scripture, having what it takes to do what God has called me to do. Scripture, in this sense, I think, is like the ultimate power tool. How many of you love power tools? Have some in your garage. Listen, I can't, could you imagine doing life without power tools? Let's give you one example of the way I use power tools. I, I cut our yard. Uh, we moved into our house last Friday, and this past week, uh, I mowed our, our lawn. I use three important power tools. All right? Number one, I used a lawnmower, a riding lawnmower. I mean, we've gone from just gasoline push mowers to now you can just sit while you're doing that. That's powerful. Amen. Yeah, that got an amen. I used a riding lawnmower. Then I used a weed eater, also gas powered. Then I used a blower. There's the thing. Could I have done all that without those power tools? Maybe. Not very effectively. I mean, we had some Amish when I was at our first church in Canaan, Indiana. This was way out in, in the sticks, and there were, there were 700 people in Canaan, Indiana, and there were at least 7,000 cows, all right? That's what the town was like. And we had some Amish people that lived out there. In fact, on the front, uh, in our front yard, right by the street, there was an Amish crossing sign. So you had to be careful that you wouldn't slam into an Amish buggy. But uh, the Amish people, man, they didn't have power tools. They had those old lawnmowers with the blades that roll, you know, like a circle, and you have to push it. And then they had goats, right? And that kept the weeds down, too. But power tools, with them, you can do so much more than you can do without them. With them, what became too great of a task for you to do in your own power becomes something that you are more than adequate and competent and equipped to do. And what I want you to know this morning is that the Bible is teaching us that Scripture is God's ultimate power tool. The work that God has given us to do, yes, is too great for you and is too great for me. But with Scripture and with the Holy Spirit, we are adequate, we are competent, we are complete, and we are equipped to do what He has to do. Scripture is the ultimate power tool. Listen to a few verses that talk about the power of God's Word, and there are so many. Listen to Jeremiah 23, verse 29. Is not my word, God says, like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? Power tool. Hebrews 4 verse 12, because we realize that the ultimately what makes our task of making disciples so difficult is that we're trying to get to the heart of people and change their hearts. And listen, that takes a miracle. That takes the supernatural power of God. But I want you to know this morning that the Bible is supernatural and can change a person's heart. Notice what the author of Hebrews says about that. Hebrews 4, verse 12 says this, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. You say, Pastor, I can't reach my neighbor with the gospel. They're too hard-hearted. Listen, Scripture can take care of that. Scripture is sharper than any two-edged sword. Scripture can discern the thoughts and intentions of the heart. You say, I can never reach the unreached nations with the gospel. Listen, Scripture can handle that. Scripture is alive and is active and is powerful and can do what apart from it cannot be done. Then one more passage. Not only is Scripture in general powerful, but the gospel message in particular, the, the kernel that's at the heart of the Word of God is powerful. Paul says it this way in Romans 1, verse 16. He says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. 
gospel means the good news of salvation in Jesus. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Notice this, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Bill, their family, I want you to know this morning, God has a great work for us to do. He has a great work for us to do, and on our own, we are completely incapable of doing it. We are completely inadequate to do it, but we're not on our own. I want you to know this morning that in the Word of God, with the Scriptures in our hands, with the Scriptures in our heart, with the Spirit of God filling us, we have everything we need. We have everything we need to be competent. We have everything we need to be equipped. We have all the power we need to do every single thing that God has called and commissioned us to do. We have been called and we have been commissioned as a church to glorify God by loving Jesus, sharing the gospel, and making disciples. And I want you to know this morning that with the word of God in our hearts and the Holy Spirit filling us, our souls, we are more than adequate to do it. We're more than adequate to do it. God can do it through us. And I want you to know this morning, the Bible and the Holy Spirit give us everything we need for the work that God has called us to do. Now, here's the thing. This is going to be, ultimately, the foundation of the next part of our journey. The next part of my journey and yours as pastor and and as a church family. Everything that we're going to be doing, everything that we're going to be doing, is going to ultimately derive its power for that work from from the Word of God. Everything we're going to be building is going to have to be built on the foundation of the Word of God in general and of the gospel in particular. Now, here's the thing. I know that they're in a room like this with this many people here. There might be some people in here this morning. And as you've been hearing about the Word of God and even particularly at the end there about the power of the gospel and the good news of salvation, you, you start to feel, feel that power. Maybe the Word of God is starting to do something in your life and in your heart already. The thoughts and intentions of your heart are being discerned. And God has already begun to take the scalpel of his word and begin to pry back the layers of your heart and show you where you are spiritually. I just want to share with you, just very briefly, that kernel of truth, the gospel message, that is the power of God and the salvation. Here's what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that you and I have sinned against God. Every person who's ever lived has sinned against God. You have broken God's laws. You've done things like lie and cheat and steal and lust and the list goes on and on. We've rebelled against God and the, what's worse is the Bible says in Romans 6, 23 that the payment for that, the wages of that sin is death. Punishment. Not just bodily and, and temporarily but eternally in hell. That's the bad news. The good news of the gospel this morning is that while you were yet a sinner Christ died that God loves you so much, John 3.16 says, that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, into this world, and if you will believe in him, you will not perish like you deserve to for your sins, but instead you will have everlasting life. When Jesus came into this world, he lived the perfect life that you and I have failed to live. He never sinned, even though he was tempted to. And then at the end of his life, Jesus died on the cross. I want you to think about that. Jesus died. Death is the punishment for sin. Why is Jesus receiving the punishment for sin if Jesus never sinned? Well, here's the answer. When Jesus was dying on the cross, he was not being punished for his sins because he didn't have any. When Jesus was dying on the cross, he was receiving the punishment for your sins and for my sins. He was our substitute. That's how much he loved us. And then Jesus was buried. And three days later, God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, raised his only begotten son back to life. And right now, he sits at the right hand of God and will one day come again to gather his people for himself. Now, here's the question. How do you make sure that what Jesus did for you and for the rest of the world, by dying for your sins and rising from the dead, how do you make sure that that applies to your life? Because it's not as if, When Jesus died and rose again, all of a sudden, everybody was just zapped with forgiveness all over the world. That's not how it works. How do you make sure it applies to you? Here's the thing. The Bible says, if you want that forgiveness to be applied to you, if you want Jesus' death to apply to you so that you can be forgiven, you've got to do two things. The first thing you have to do is you have to repent of your sin. 
To repent of your sins means you turn from your sins. You say, God, I know I've sinned against you. I know I've broken your laws. I confess it. I admit it. Please forgive me. I am sorry for it. Help me to turn from my sins. Please forgive me. And the second thing the Bible says you have to do is not only repent, you must believe. Believe what? Well, believe that Jesus is God's son. Believe that Jesus did die on the cross for your sins. Believe that he did rise from the dead and he's alive right now and forever. And believe that he is your only hope to ever be forgiven and to ever escape the punishment you deserve for your sins. Now, so here's the deal. How do you express to God? How do you express to God that you want to repent of your sins and believe in him and be saved? The Bible says that you do that through prayer. The scripture says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. God has spoken to us in the scriptures and in the gospel. You speak to God through prayer. And when a sinner calls on God's name in prayer and repents of their sins and believes in Jesus, the Bible says that person in that moment is forgiven, is saved, is made new, is made part of the family of God. God becomes your father, you become his child, and you're forgiven of everything wrong you've ever done just in eternity with him in a place called heaven. Isn't that good news? So that's the message of the gospel. That's the message of scripture. And that message is mine. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you in prayer right now, thanking you for your word to us, Lord. We believe that the scriptures are true. We confess it right now together that we believe that the Bible is your word, that in the pages of this book, we hear your voice. And God, we commit right now as a church family, and I commit as a pastor and preacher that we will, with your help, See this church built on the foundation of your word. We don't want to do it any other way, Lord, because there's no other way it can be done. 